Hey everyone, and welcome to our September live event with Nikki LaFoyle for National Sewing Circle. Thank you for being here again, Nikki. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. All right. So for the next hour, we are going to work our way through answering as many of your sewing questions as we possibly can, those that were pre-submitted and those uh, that you want to ask live during the next hour. And you can do that by entering your question into the comment box below the video. So we're going to start right off with a question from Linda. And she says, I am a novice sewer, but I want to be a great sewer. I want to make my own beautiful clothes. And she's going to join a sewing club and take advantage of free lessons. Can you suggest anything else that I can do? Well, um, Linda, I think that that is great that you're um, trying to, to learn more. And I applaud your ambition. I would say just keep practicing. Um, I know sometimes it can be a little frustrating and overwhelming because there are so many resources out there and so much information, and sometimes it's hard to know where to go and who to trust. So I would suggest um, just finding yourself a couple of resources, two or three or four um, resources, and exhaust everything they have to offer because you'll know that um, they are tried and true, tested methods. Um, so obviously National Sewing Circle is a great resource. Um, I used to work for Sew News Magazine, so I'm going to point you to sewnews.com, sewitalltv.com, and sewitallmag.com for sewists, and cmemag.com, which is Creative Machine Embroidery Magazine's website for creative machine embroiderers. Um, and I love um, Melissa's blog, Melly Sews, M-E-L-L-Y Sews. Um, she has a lot of great tutorials uh, for sewing kids' clothes. So I know somebody asked about finding kids' patterns. Um, Melissa's blog, MellySews.com, is great. She also has her pattern line, Blank Slate Patterns, which is a lot of kids' patterns, which are awesome. Um, and CurvySewingCollective.com is a great site, not just for curvy ladies. I've learned a lot from that site. Um, and if anybody else has any great resources that they go to, share it in the comments so we can uh, share the knowledge. Uh, but I would just recommend to keep practicing, keep building your skills, adding more challenging techniques um, as you go, and um, best of luck. Absolutely. All right, so we've got some questions coming in here, and we'll get right to them. Uh, and this first one kind of goes along with something that you were going to talk about a little later on anyway with pattern alterations. So uh, this question is from Janice, and she says, I have large upper arms. What is the best way to enlarge this area without making the armhole too big? Um, so you can enlarge the armhole a little bit to, to give yourself a little more room starting, um, starting up there. But um, to slash and spread probably at the bicep line is where you want to add most of your, um, uh, most of the, the extra space. Um, because like you said, you don't want to add too much to the armhole because then that can get baggy and then affect all the other fit areas. So the bicep line actually, um, right here, you can slash and open up um, some space um, slashing probably um, down, let's see. Um, I've never done that adjustment before, so I'm trying to uh, figure out how that would work. Um, I have seen patterns that um, you can slash down this way and almost add like an insert pleat kind of, and that gives you a little extra fullness there, so that could be one way to do that. Um, and that would only add the, air, the fullness up here and wouldn't do mm -hmm. anything with the pattern down here, so that might be an option. Yeah, I would think you would have to like slash down the center and along the bicep line and kind of rotate everything out so that you would have some more space in the center. Um, but I don't know the I don't know if that would be the best way to do it since I've never done that alteration. I'd suggest probably um, typing that into your internet browser and and see what uh, some other people have to say who have maybe done that. Sorry, I can't be more specific on that one. All right, we're going to go to another question that has to do with armholes as well. Um, and this is from Sonia, and she wants to know how you reduce the size of the sleeve cap when the sleeve cap is way too big for the armhole on a set-in sleeve. Okay, so to reduce the sleeve cap, that's what I drew this one for. Um, so you want to um, get an idea of how, 
how much you want to take out of the sleeve cap. So you can um, sew up a, a mock-up and um, see how much extra you have and how much you want to get rid of. Or you can kind of walk that seam around and see if you think it's too much. Um, so if you want to take out a half inch from your, your sleeve cap, you would. So you would draw a line from the center of your sleeve cap down to the bicep line. And if you want to take out a half inch, take another sheet of paper, draw a center line, and then split the difference of your half inch that you wanna take out. So you draw a quarter inch line on one side of the center line and a quarter inch on the other side of the center line. And then you're going to slash from the sleeve cap upper edge down to the bicep line and then slash outward to the edge, but leave a little paper hinge on each edge. And this is one method I've um, seen other people say there are different methods, but this is just the one that I know. So you can try this one or you can go search for some other methods. So here's what it looks like when it's slashed. So you've got your paper hinges on the sides and it's open there. So you're gonna lay this on your extra piece of paper that has your lines drawn on it. I'm gonna tilt my camera down so hopefully you'll be able to see. So aligning the center line of your sleeve pattern with the center line that you drew on this extra piece of paper. And then you're going to rotate the left side in so that the edge of your cut edge touches the outer quarter inch line and you'll want to tape that down and then rotate the other piece in so that that edge touches the other side of the quarter inch line so the far side so they're each rotated in and touching um, the opposite edge of the um, the lines that you drew on either side of your center line and then you'll want to redraw your bicep line so that it's straight from point to point and then true your, your sleeve cap up by just kind of splitting the difference um, up at the top and true that back down into the line. And then you'll probably want to, to make sure that the notches still match um, your arm's eye notches. You'll probably want to just walk that bit. Um, and if you're only doing it, I, I didn't choose a very large amount for my demo, but if you're only taking out a half inch, um, your notches will probably still match, but if you're taking out like an inch, um, the more these rotate in, the the more these notches may get off from the arm side notches. So you might want to um, walk those patterns to make sure the notches will still match. So that is how you take some uh, some ease out of your sleeve cap. Is there um, like a maximum amount that you can take out before it's it just doesn't work? Um, it depends on how much ease you're starting with. So that's kind of dependent on the pattern you're working with. Perfect. All right, now we do have another question, uh, again, it's talking about shoulders, and so you just kind of touched on this a little bit. Um, we didn't quite have a definitive answer for it, but maybe give her the same suggestion. Um, this is from Cheryl, and she says, I have narrow shoulders along with large upper arms. How can I deal with this? Um, well, for narrow shoulders, um, you can pretty easily take that seam up, um, just pull it in, um, you know, try on your pattern or just like pin fit the pattern on your body without like actually cutting it out into fabric. And you want, you know, you want your shoulders to seem, seem to sit right at the edge of your shoulder. So if your the shoulder seam is always like hanging far off your shoulder, you can just take that in as much as you need to to get it to sit where it's supposed to. And of course, anything you do to the front of the pattern, you, you want to do to the back of the pattern too so that those seams will always match up. Um, and as for large upper arms, unfortunately, like I said, I haven't done many of those alterations to patterns. Um, so that would be another area to, to see, uh, do a little research online. Sorry, I can't help much with that. I'm going to, I'm going to figure out the answer as soon as we go off the air. I'm sure. Yeah. So I tune in yeah. next month and we'll definitely have the follow up and we'll know how to do this one then. All right, our next question here is from Sally, and she wants to know, what is your fabric stash like? What types of fabric do you have, and what do you make? Oh, man. I had 
Um, I had bins and bins and bins of fabric, and I just narrowed it down to two drawers in this dresser over here. <laughs> um, How did you narrow it down? How do you get rid of fabric? It was like the hardest thing I've ever done. <laughs> Uh, but there were some fabrics that I had had for years and years and I'd never done anything with and I was forced to be like I can't just keep carrying this around from house to house and state to state anymore um, but I have a lot of cottons I have a lot of quilting cottons those are good for um, skirts and garments so I have a lot of those I have some faux leathers since I'm doing some things with faux leather um, I have just a couple things of like I have some minky that I was going to make a blanket for my daughter, never got around to. Um, and I have a couple of satins, um, just like leftover things from garments. Um, but yeah, I, I make mostly garments, so um, just kind of uh, easy wear things, like, like daily wear, you know, shirts and skirts. Um, so cotton is, is good for those. So I've got a lot of lightweight cotton. Perfect. All right, our next question here, we're going back to some more pattern alter, altering, and this is from Dee, and she says, how do I increase the bust size from a smaller size pattern? Um, so that's kind of dependent on um, the pattern as well, like where you have darts, um, but you can, you can always um, <clears throat> increase the side seam pretty easily by just taking that... Um, the side seam line and bringing it out a little bit um, up at the top and then um, truing that back into the the side seam line back at the waist. Um, I know there is a, let's see, there is a um, full bust adjustment tutorial um, on the curvysewingcollective.com. So they have a tutorial section um, you can you can go to Curvy Sewing Collective and search on the site full bust adjustment, and um, they have really good uh, a good tutorial there. Um, so that would be a good resource. They have a lot of good pictures. I'm looking at it right now. Yeah. Well, and you know I have to throw out that of course National Sewing Circle has a full bust adjustment video that um, a good friend of ours Beth Bradley did and it's a really good video so uh, that yeah. one is uh, another I mean it's good to always have different um, there might be different methods too so check, check them both out um, but if you are already on our site go ahead and check that one out a really good video for that as well mm -hmm. and that uh, includes um, just like slashing the pattern from the arm side and from the dart and kind of opening up those pieces so there's um, a couple resources to go to anyway. Absolutely. All right. So since we were talking a little bit about fabric stashes, let's just talk about fabric in general. So we have a question here from Alina, and she wants to know what the best way to sew slippery fabrics is. Slippery fabrics. So um, like satins um, and slippery things like some slinky knits can be really um, slippery and slick. Um, so those fabrics can benefit from the use of um, double-sided washable tape so like a fusible web but in just like a tape form um, and I used um, I made a pair of satin pants and I used that on every single seam and it was a lifesaver um, I did it right next to the raw edge they say you can sew through it and you probably can I just don't it's just a personal preference um, so just having that it was like a quarter inch tape just having it right along the raw edge um, so that I wasn't stitching into it with my half inch seam allowance, but it was still enough that it kept the layers from shifting um, close to my seam allowance line. So that's an option and that will just wash away with washing. Um, or you can, you can put your pins in um, parallel to the raw edge instead of doing them perpendicular to your raw edge and your seam allowance. So pinning within the seam allowance um, perpendicular to the rod with the head um, toward you so that you can pull out the pins as you're sewing. Um, that can help um, secure kind of a larger area together as you're sewing. Um, and a lot of times with slippery fabrics, um, they can be, you know, kind of lighter weight. So sometimes people have problems with it pushing down into the throat plate. A lot of times that happens right at the the edge of the fabric when you're starting. So I always suggest starting not right at the raw edge, start a couple of 
um, like stitches in, so like a half inch in or quarter inch in, and then back stitching and then continuing forward on with your seam. Um, that can help. And uh, sometimes if your layers are slippery, slipping around, um, that can be a problem with um, the feed dogs pulling one the, the bottom layer faster than the upper layer. So uh, a roller foot or a walking foot can sometimes help with that. Um, you can try spraying your fabric with spray starch if it's really like wobbly. Some spray starch can stiffen that up um, to make it a little bit easier to work with as you're sewing it and then that can wash away with your washing afterward. Uh, or um, sandwiching the layers between tissue paper. Uh, that can keep the, help keep the layers together and prevent shifting. Um, what else? I think that's my, oh, um, a straight stitch throat plate can also help with the fabric getting pushed down into the throat plate. So you can, you can start a couple stitches in from the edge, or if you're still having trouble with the fabric getting pushed down into, throat, into the throat plate, um, along other areas of the seam, if you're using a really lightweight, slippery fabric, a straight stitch throw plate can help. It just has a, um, you can't do a zigzag stitch with it. You can only do a straight stitch because it only has one hole um, straight under the needle. Um, but that can help with that. So uh, that's my basic checklist for slippery fabrics. Hope that helps. Perfect. All right. So from slippery fabrics to leather, that's what we're going to move to next. So. Cindy wants to know what are the basics for sewing leather? What type of thread do you use? Needles? Do you need a walking foot? That kind of stuff. So the opposite of slippery fabric. Yes. Leather is very sticky sometimes. Um, so I haven't done much with genuine leather, but I know um, the, the advice is to use a leather needle, uh, specifically made with a reinforced shaft and a very sharp point to pierce through those, that thick leather. Um, and using top stitch or a, like a heavier weight thread, like a top stitch thread, um, to go through those heavy, thick layers of, of leather. Um, I haven't worked much with genuine leather, but with full leather, I'm actually doing a video for a national sewing circle on taping next month. So we'll probably be a couple months before it's up on the site, but, um, you can check back for that. That go, we'll go in great detail on sewing full leather, but, um, the basics are, um, there are lots of different kinds of faux leather, which makes it kind of hard to do a, a blanket um, a blanket guide. But um, for some of the thinner faux leathers, um, I would recommend not using the leather needle because it can make too large of holes. So an all-purpose needle is fine. And I use all-purpose thread uh, for my construction seams. Um, but for seams that will be seen on the outside, I like to use top stitch thread just because it looks nice. And when you're going through um, multiple layers, a lot of times um, some top stitch thread is, is nice to go through all those multiple layers. Um, for leathers that are really shiny and sticky, like a pleather or vinyl, you might want to, um, if the presser foot is kind of sticking to that, the surface of that, um, you might want to have a PTFE foot, sometimes called a Teflon foot, or a roller foot actually can help just feed that fabric uh, through so that it's not, you know, sticking to your, the metal of the presser foot. Or even some matte scotch tape, the kind that has like the slick surface on the underside of your presser foot can be enough to just help that glide through. Um, so that's for needles and thread. Um, Sometimes it might be nice to have a wallpaper roller or just like a roller. Um, I don't know if they make them for sewing. I just have a wallpaper roller to roll the seams instead of pressing them because with leather you don't want to use um, high heat. So um, a roller of some kind to, to roll those seams out. Um, so that is my, my basic cheat sheet for leather. Um, you can also use a walking foot to, to try to um, to combat that sticking to the presser foot. Um, I prefer a roller foot over walking foot. It's just a personal preference, but they can kind of be used interchangeably um, in that regard. So it's my, my full leather cheat sheet for you. See, you're so sophisticated with your roll. I use my rolling pin from my kitchen. Like that's what I bring down and I, I don't have any other roller. 
Ingenuity, Ashley. I like it. It honestly gets more use in the sewing room. <laughs> All right, our next one about fabric here is Tina wants to know what sewing machine needle do I use to sew sequin fabric? So sequin fabric, you actually don't need any special needle. Um, you can use an all-purpose needle. The, the important thing is, is to take the sequins out of your seam allowance. You don't want to sew through them. They're hard plastic. You could break a needle. So you want to just get them out of the seam allowance. So you can do that by... Um, uh, you might want to use some glue. So if you're cl clipping uh, sequins out of the seam allowance, a lot of sequins are um, sewn onto the fabric with the same length of thread. So if you clip one off, you don't want all the rest to come off from that thread. So use some glue and dab it on that thread um, just outside of the sequin that you want to clip off. Um, or you can uh, just clip the sequins off of the thread, either using kind of, uh, sharp snips that you don't mind dulling because you're cutting plastic they'll get dull pretty quick or um not pliers but the little clippy things that look like pliers i have some in my jewelry making kit to cut metal um so like a metal cutter little tool like that um just cut the sequins out of the seam allowance um so that you, your needle doesn't run over any of those but then you can use your all-purpose needle to sew through the fabric because a lot of times it's just like a polyester mesh backing that you can just use your regular needle to sew through. Absolutely, and you know I'm always about plugging videos on National Sewing Circle, and this time I finally get to plug one of my own. So I actually just did a class on sewing with difficult fabric. So it covers faux leather and faux fur and sequins and slinky fabric and sheer fabric, and so you can watch that until Nikki comes out with uh, her faux leather one. So all sorts of information there about all different kinds of fabric. Moving on, we have a question here from Susan, and she wants to know, are there any places you can get machine-specific lessons to download? She says, due to a major pipe burst and a water leak, insurance upgraded her machine to a Ruby Deluxe. Nice. Wow. And she, which says, she says intimidates her, and she would like a DVD-type class that she can play and replay until she feels comfortable with that machine. Machine-specific lessons. I'm not sure. I've never looked for machine-specific lessons. I'm sure... Um, maybe the, the machine company website, um, you can check there for lessons on each, their each, um, model, or you can call a dealer and see if they sell anything, um, at the dealer, any DVDs or something like that. But, um, um Absolutely. I know um, even just the basic uh, brother machine that I have behind me came with a DVD in the box and it just had like basic operations, um, showing you how to use it. So I, if, if it's not something that came with the machine, yeah, I definitely think, like Nikki said, that you'd be able to find it um, somewhere on the manufacturer's website or something. All right, we have another question about fabric, and this is from Peggy. And she says, I struggle with finding the right and wrong side of fabric that is not printed, such as solids and some batiks. Uh, is there a way that you can find the right side? Um, sometimes uh, on the salvage, they will have um, some print, um, like saying the designer or the line or something. So that can tell you um, on the salvage if there's print, but if there isn't, or if there's no salvage on it, if it's just um, you know a little swatch from somewhere. Um, if it's a solid color uh, that doesn't have a nap, um, I tend to kind of use it interchangeably. If there's, if you know, you flip one side over and look, and you, if you can't tell when you're like this close looking at it. Nobody else is going to be able to tell either when you're wearing it or using it. Uh, make sure you look at it in good lighting to make sure um, there's no differences between the front and back. Um, sometimes if you look really close, you might be able to look at the weave and see um, if it's not just an even weave, if it's like a twill weave or, um, or a sateen, a satin weave. Um, if it has like more warp threads on the top or the bottom, you might be able to tell um, not maybe not what is the right side and the wrong side, but you could designate yourself a right side and and stick to that. But um, but yeah, if you can't really tell if it's a solid, then I would I kind of use them interchangeably. I think it doesn't really doesn't really matter with uh, construction or anything. So either either way, absolutely, and it just makes it easier sometimes too to not have to worry about it. Yeah. 
All right, so I want to remind anyone who's just tuning in, or even if you've been watching from the very beginning, uh, feel free to submit your questions. We have a little over a half hour left that we'll still be working our way through answering as many questions as we can. Uh, so don't be shy. Go ahead and submit your questions in the comment section under this video, and Nikki will answer those. Um, so now we're going to put her to work a little bit. So this question is from Susan, and she wants to know what a French seam is. Um, a French seam, Susan, is... Um, it's a type of seam that is, it encloses the seam allowance um, in the seam. So it's really good for use in um, sheer fabrics. Um, since you, you'll be able to see, if it's a garment, you'll be able to see um, the seam allowance from the right side when you're wearing it. Um, and it's a, a nice way to just kind of finish your seam allowances too. It's pretty easy. So you start um, with the, the fabrics wrong sides together. And if you're using a 5 8 inch seam allowance, we we'll want to stitch your seam allowance using a 3 8 inch seam allowance because we're going to turn it and stitch it again. So use a 3 8 inch seam allowance and stitch your seam and then trim that in about, about half. And then turn it with the right sides together. And you know you would press that to one side so that you get a nice crisp seam so that you can have your seam right along the edge there. And since you trimmed the seam allowance down, then you can stitch with the remaining quarter inch seam to get your full 5 8 inch seam allowance. And that will, I'm gonna just do it off a little quickly to show you how it looks when it's finished. Sewing with your quarter inch. That will enclose those seam allowances so they are nice and there's no raw edges and then the seam on the right side just looks like a regular seam. So it's great for, like I said, sheer fabrics but um, can be used for any other lightweight fabrics. Sometimes it's, it's not the best uh, seam to use for bulkier fabrics because you're not going to be able to um, get it folded around um, those fabric layers but some lightweight fabrics like a lightweight quilting cotton, it's really great um, to use if you want to have your seam allowances finished. Perfect. All right, our next question here is from Maggie, and she wants to know how to make a 45 degree angle when placing a border. Okay, so that um, is mitering your corner. So if you are mitering something, you know, you've got your bias strip and you're finishing the, the raw edges of your project with this um, strip. Um, not necessarily bias, actually, um, but your binding strip. So this strip is just caught on the straight grain because I'm binding my trivet with it, which coincidentally has my insulated batting in there. I think last time somebody asked about what to uh, what to use for like lunch bags and things, and this is your it's got um, those flecks of silver insulation in there. So that's my insul bright, my insulated batting. So, and I've got my Binding strip, so I'm, I've got a, a half inch finished binding, so I cut my strip at two inches and I'm using a half inch seam allowance. So I apply my binding with right sides together, um, raw edges aligned, and I'm gonna sew, uh, so I pressed this in half and then folded each edge in toward the center to get my, um, my stitching lines. So I'm gonna sew right along this uh, this first ironed line, which is a half inch. So I'm going to just, I did one corner, which I'll show you, but I want to show the, the stitching of the corners. So I'm going to turn around again really fast. So we're going to stitch up to up to this corner, and we're going to stop our seam allowance away from this edge. So I've marked my half inch seam allowance away from this next edge. I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna back stitch. I'm gonna take this out to show. Here's my stitching line down here. I'm going to fold this 
up this way at a 45 degree angle from here and then back down this way to align with the next edge. And then I'm going to start stitching again. I'm going to turn and start stitching right at the raw edge. So you can st stitch right over this fold that you just made along this edge. Following my half inch seam allowance line. And then, so here's what that looks like when it's stitched. And then you would just fold that around to the wrong side. And you get yourself on the wrong side, you have to use your fingers to fold that into a miter. But on the right side, you've gotten that nice angle there in the corner, which I'll show you on the one that I already stitched. That nice little angle, get my face out of the way. And then on the wrong side, I have it just pinned, but um, you can use your fingers to fold that into a little miter. So, it, you know, it comes out like this. And then you fold it under and then just tuck it in like that to get that angle. Um, and then I would just, you know, stitch from the, from the right side, stitch in the ditch to catch that, that fold on the wrong side. But um, that is how you do a miter. It's really easy, just um, folding this strip up and then back down to align with the next edge. So hopefully you could see that and um, that offered some clarity on the subject. Perfect. I have a question. So with you, depending on how thick you're doing your binding, do you ever go back and stitch along the folded part of that 45 so you don't get things caught in there? Yes. Yep. If it is um, a wider border, um, that that fold along the miter will be, you know, kind of free. So you might uh, machine stitch that along that fold, or you might hand stitch it just to um, to keep everything nice and flat. But yes, good question. Perfect. All right, our next question here is from Gail, and she says, when you lose weight and your pants are far too big, where is the best place to take them in, from the sides or from the inside leg? Yes, um, I would do from the outer seam for sure to start at least. Um, and you can stitch, you know, trying your pants um, inside out and kind of, you know, pinch it out and pin it um, so that you can see how much you need to take in. And you can... Um, you can stitch right through the waistband uh, seam to take in the waistband from the sides. Just go really slowly because if it's jeans, you have a lot of layers to go through. So um, use a denim needle and, you know, walk your needle using the, the, the wheel um, over those really thick areas with a lot of, of seams to go through. Um, and, yeah, just um, either if you're taking in all the way down, take in all the way down, or if you... Um, <clears throat> are just taking in an area like down to the knee, just, um, you know, measure how much you want to take in and through that line, blend it back into the original seam. And um, yeah, just uh, on the outer seam. Perfect. All right, our next question here is from Constance, and she says, I need to have a zipper for my mom's bathing suit. She's 94 years old. Um, she says that she just started and loves warm water aerobics, and so she wants to know how she can adapt a bathing suit to have a zipper in the back so it's easier to put on. Constance, that is amazing. I love that. Um, so to add a zipper to the back of a bathing suit, um, you want to stabilize the area with some Trico interfacing. So Trico is just like a stretchy knit interfacing. Um, it's very lightweight. So... I would place that on the wrong side of the area that you're going to put the zipper. And I would, um, to insert the zipper, I would cut a line as long as the zipper and from the bottom do your Y cut into the corners. Um, about, um, I think like a quarter inch um, on each side of the, the center line is a good kind of place to start. Um, and then place your one zipper tape, unzip the zipper. Place the zipper tape with the um, the edge of the tape along the 
one edge, one cut edge of your bathing suit with the right sides together. Stitch that, do the same thing to the other side and just stitch the bottom. You know, fold everything out of the way and you'll have a little triangle of fabric from when you did your Y cut and you can stitch that to the bottom of the zipper. And just be careful when you're stitching across the zipper to again use your, your hand wheel and you know wiggle the zipper if you need to get your needle in between the zipper teeth um, to stitch across the bottom of the zipper. Or if you don't want to actually insert the zipper, you can um, just kind of place the zipper um, right side up with the you know the fabric and the zipper right side up, just kind of place it over your cut. And um, because they make zippers with super cute zipper tape these days, you can get one of those and um, just stitch the zipper over the, the slash that you made down the back of the, the, um, the bathing suit. Um, but you want to make sure you've got the bathing suit um, against the feed dogs as you're sewing it because the, the fabric is going to want to stretch a little bit when it um, attaches to the zipper. And the seam will look a little wavy probably when it is um, laying flat, but when it's on, the material is going to stretch and it's going to lay nice and flat against the body. So um, you can try one of those methods and good luck. I think that's awesome. So just to follow up, talking about stitching, so you have, you know, a stretchy fabric, so you would normally be using some, a stretch needle, but you have a non-stretchy zipper tape. Does that matter? Do you still need the stretch needle? Um, you can still use a stretch needle um, to go through zipper tape. The stretch needle still has a sharp point. It's just a little bit more ball pointed so that it, it won't um, cut the fibers of the, the stretchy material, but it will still go through zipper tape. Perfect. All right, we have another bathing suit question, actually, uh, and this is from Julie, and she says, how do you sew elastic into a bathing suit bottom legs? Um, while I have never done bathing suit bottoms, I've done underwear, which I feel like the same principles can be applied to, um, but I use fold-over elastic for the legs, and that's a super easy way to get your elastic onto the legs. Um, fold-over elastic is the kind that's uh, it looks like it's got a little indent kind of along the, the horizontal center line of the elastic. Um, so you will want to cut your fold over elastic to the size that you, you want it to be to go around your leg so that it's snug but not tight. Um, and then stitch the short ends together just using a straight stitch. Um, and um, I've, I've heard people recommend um, finishing the edges of the elastic with a flame, like with a lighter. Um, so you might want to think about doing that. Um, and then, so quarter mark your, your band of fold over elastic and quarter mark the, the leg of the, the bathing suit and um, with right um, raw edges together or edges together, uh, match up the pins. And then as you're stitching between the pins, um, stretch the underwear or the, the bathing suit fabric to match the, um, the elastic. And, um, and then actually for fold over elastic, I'm, I'm giving instructions for, uh, for regular elastic application, but fold over elastic, actually you fold it and you encase the raw edge in the center of that, um, that elastic. So that, that indent that goes along the horizontal center line, um, place that right with the raw edge and, fold it over, but then you'll, you still want to, you know, quarter mark the elastic and then stretch it as you're stitching it on. Um, probably a better explanation, I'm going to point you to um, <clears throat> sewitalltv.com, episode 913 that has Monica Bravo, and she um, talks about making underwear using that, that technique and also um, attaching lace um, to the waistband of underwear, which can also probably be used for the leg as well, um, doing... Uh, lace, you know, stretch lace. Um, so she's got <clears throat> good instructions on there. If you can, if you have the DVDs, that'd be even better to watch the episode or find it on PBS somehow. Um, but she has good instructions on there, which probably be better than my like, do it this way. <laughs> I try my best. I hope I, I, I did really like the claw though. I mean, that was probably my favorite. Good visual. <laughs> yeah. All right. Our next question here is from Lisa, and she uh, wants to know about something that she has seen on ready-to-wear clothing. So she wants to know how do you add a partial ruffle at the top of a shoulder sleeve, and how would you measure for extra fabric? 
Um, partial ruffle. Um, so just like a ruffle at the at the top of the shoulder. She says around two inches, so that that's what I'm going to assume. Yeah. How do you measure for extra fabric? Um, so how would you measure like the ruffle length? Like how much you want it to ruffle? If I'm understanding that correctly. Um, rough for like ruffling and for shearing, I like to use a double. Um, just double the the fabric. So if you want it to be um, two inches of ruffle, I would use four inches of fabric, and that's kind of a good place to start. And you can sew it up and see how the ruffle looks and how it lays, depending on what kind of fabric you're using. And if you want to make it fuller, um, add more fabric, um, cut your strip longer, or if you don't want it as full, use less. So, but doubling is usually a good place to start with ruffles. Yeah, and then um, any tips on how she can add that ruffle to the actual shoulder? Um, I would, um, you can lay it, um, if it's a, a ready-to-wear um, shirt, I'd lay the, the raw edge of the ruffle so um, with the, the shoulder seam and um, stitch there and then fold the ruffle so the ruffle will be like facing this way. You have the raw edge here, stitch there. Then fold the ruffle down and do another line of stitches um, to hold the ruffle so that it's facing this way. And then the seam, the raw edge would be encased in that seam. Absolutely. And um, I forgot to mention uh, that part of her question said that it was her own pattern, but so you can still, you would still be able to do that the same way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Next time, I promise I'll read the full question. Okay. Okay. Our next one here is from Diane, and similar to a question that you just answered about pants, but she wants to know if dress pants are too large, where is the one area that you can open and take up the entire pant? Take up the entire pant. Um, you can open up the crotch seam um, and make your alterations from there. But I wouldn't want to do all of the alterations from there. You want to kind of split it in between um, the crotch seam and the inseam and the, the outside seam. Um, otherwise, your proportions are going to maybe get off. But I have, I just brought my jeans kind of anticipating something like this. Um, so you can take this crotch seam here. Everybody knows what I mean when I say crotch seam. I don't know why I'm bringing in a visual, but the seam right here, you can take that and take it in, take things in from there, and then you'll want to take in from the inseam, because when you take in from the crotch seam, you'll want to take in from the inseam as well to keep everything balanced. Um, but yeah, um, if if every, every area is too big, um, you can start with the crotch seam and then um, that affects the inseam, so you'll want to take an inseam a little bit. But I do recommend keeping everything proportional and splitting the difference between um, inner seams and the outer seams as well. Absolutely. And I think, um, too, like when you're talking about, so taking up the pants, it's kind of like if the pants are too baggy, that's when you want to work in the inseam area and kind of bring that up. And you're talking about earlier sizing um, in just overall along the outer mm -hmm. seams of the, the jeans to just sort of make them smaller that way, too. So yeah. kind of depends on where they're, where they're too big. Exactly. All right. Our next question is from Sally. And she says, you really can answer such a wide variety of questions. Very knowledgeable. Did you know a lot about sewing before Sew News Magazine? Thank you, Sally. That's very nice. Um, I did. I, I, went to, um, I went to college and got my BA in apparel design and construction. Um, so I learned a lot there. Um, I took a lot of sewing classes and design classes, so I got a really good understanding of clothing construction and um, pattern making. Um, but I, I learned a ton at Sew News just from editing the stories and seeing all the projects that came in and meeting all the cool people. Um, I worked on Sew It All TV as well, and I got to meet all the guests and watch all the episodes and was on Sew It All TV actually as well, which was super fun. Um, and I traveled to um, trade shows for the magazine, teaching classes. So I, I learned a bunch just from, from
from people and um, I wrote the tips column for Sony's magazine so people would send in tips and that was like I was like a sponge soaking up all of those tips it's like that's such a good idea so I learned a lot from Sony's readers just um, sharing the knowledge and anytime I want to make something if I don't know how I'll google it and go online and just um, continuing my education all the time so um, thank you for that question, Sally. That was very nice. But um, but yeah, I, I learn a lot from, from everywhere. Absolutely. I got to work on Sony's Magazine, too, so I just learned from Nikki. That's really where I learned from. Thanks, Ashley. <laughs> All right, our next question here is from Kathy, and she says, when doing a table runner, can one just add on to it to make it larger? She wants to know how she should do it to make it most effective. Yes. Um, my mother-in-law makes a lot of quilts and table runners and, um, you know, she, she just uses blocks and different like cool formations and it's really easy to just add on uh, length or width by adding just another block in whatever um, width you need, <clears throat> either of, you know, the same kind of fabric on each end or a different fabric on each end or color. So it's really easy to just like add strips or blocks around um, and make it kind of look like a border, like a pre-border before the the binding. Um, so yeah, I think that's a quick and easy way to to make something larger if you need to. Is just kind of adding strips or blocks um, on each end. Absolutely. All right. Our next question here is from Marie, and she says, in making a baby clothes quilt, does one cut the backs off of each piece of bathing baby clothing? and then tack or sew them to another piece of material. She says she's having uh, difficulty finding uh, information about this on the internet. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would. I would cut um, cut a, a shape, a square ideally, um, or a rectangle, something that would be easy to sew onto another piece. Um, cut that shape from the, the front of the, the baby clothes and centering, if there's like a cute motif, you know, you wanna center that motif on the, your block that you cut out. Um, and just make sure that your blocks are the same size along at least one edge so that you can piece them together and have, you know, even edges on each edge. Um, and then um, I don't think you would need any other layers under it before you're batting. So just be the baby clothes and then the batting and then the backing um, to make your, your quilt. Yeah. I think I think it, it, it depends, too, on what you, the baby clothes are made out of. Um, Sometimes, you know, if they're like onesies or something that are super stretchy, like a t-shirt, then you do stabilize the back. So if you are having trouble finding information specifically about baby clothes quilts, try searching for t-shirt quilts. Because um, I know there's all sorts of, of tips and tricks and tons of videos out there for that. So that might also be helpful. All right, our next question here is from Patricia. She says she plans to make adult bibs and might line some adult aprons with vinyl. Any advice for sewing with vinyl combined with cotton blends? Yes. Um, so I would recommend um, sewing with the with the vinyl against the feed dogs um, because like I mentioned with sewing with leather, sometimes um, things like leather and vinyl, um, things that are kind of sticky can stick to the, the underside of the presser foot because it's just smooth metal. But if you do it against the feed dogs, you have something pulling that through. Um, and then just if you are stitching it, the vinyl to the, the other fabric, like with right sides together and stitching and then turning it right side out, um, the vinyl seam allowance is going to be pretty thick. So you want to make sure you cut some of that out so that you don't have a lot of bulk in your seam allowances. So pinking shears can be a really good a good tool for that, especially if you're sewing around a curve. Um, just hit it, clip it with the pinking shears, uh, like a, a quarter inch or a scant quarter inch away from the seam allowance to get rid of a lot of that bulk um, as you're turning things right side out. Absolutely. All right. Our next question here is from Rose, and she says she wants to know the tricks to showing sewing t-shirts or leggings with stretchy material without getting any puckers. Yes, that is, that's a common problem when sewing um, that stretchy fabric, that jersey knit. So puckers to me kind of says like the wavy seam, that wavy seam that you get when you stitch knits. Um, so to combat that, you can do a couple of things. You can use, um, you can use a roller foot or a walking foot on the top. 
because uh, you get that wavy seam when the fabric stretches too much as you're sewing. Um, so you can use one of those feet or you can loosen your presser foot pressure because sometimes when that presser foot is pressing down too hard on the fabric, it uh, makes it too hard to go, go through, go under your needle and it stretches it more than you want it to stretch as you're sewing. Um, but if you can't loosen your presser foot pressure, it's a tongue twister, um, a walking foot or a roller foot is a good tool. Um, but something really simple and quick and easy that I've found to help with those wavy seams is just putting one layer of tissue paper under your seam. And that can stabilize um, that stretchy fabric enough um, that you don't get it up those wavy seams and you don't get it stretched out. So just a little bit of stabilizer. Um, if you have stabilizer, like tearaway stabilizer, I'll use that. But tissue paper is super easy to find. You know, you use it in all your gift bags when you're giving gifts. So um, if you have a stash of tissue paper from gift bags, like I do, you can just use one of those. Or you can use scraps um, of tissue paper from when you're cutting out patterns. You know, you have all those scraps on the edges. Um, you just need enough to go right under that seam, um, and that's all. So scraps can work really well for that. Um, if if puckers for you means puckers like um, like the fabric pulling in instead of stretching out, so if you mean that when you say puckers, that can be a tension issue. So even if your your seam looks balanced, um, if the if both tensions are too tight, you can get that pulling and that fabric pulling. So you might have to loosen the the needle um, the needle tension and the bobbin tension so that it's not quite so tight if you're getting those kinds of puckers on your seam. So you can try some of those and see if that helps. Here you kept your tissue paper stash and you got rid of some fabric from your fabric stash. I can't believe you. What's wrong with my priorities? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. <laughs> All right. Our next question here is from Kathy, and she says, what is a good way to sew straight lines? I have sewn for years, but still don't get my lines or seams straight. Um, a couple of good tips um, for that, Kathy. I know it can be really, it can be tough to, like, try and watch the edge of the fabric when you're sewing. Um, that's what always what I do is if I'm sewing a seam, I watch that the, the raw edge pick a point on my presser foot and uh, make sure the raw edge stays along right at that point. Um, or you can draw yourself the line. Um, that is a, is a really good, a good habit to kind of get into. Um, when I'm sewing curves, a lot of times I'll, I'll draw myself a line just because it makes it easier. Uh, draw your seam allowance line. Or you can mark a line on the, the bed um, of your sewing machine in front of the needle and mark, so if you have like a thick, uh, masking tape or something, you can uh, use your ruler and measure from the needle and mark on the tape a quarter inch, half inch, five eighth inch, and line up your um, your raw edge with that instead of trying to like pick a random point on your um, presser foot. Uh, sometimes that can help to have exactly quarter inch, half inch, five eighth inch marked right there on some tape in front of uh, in front of your needle. So you can try something like that. Hopefully that'll help. Absolutely. So since you're talking about presser feet, we have a couple questions about presser feet. Um, and Denise says that she would like to start shearing. How do I do this and do I need a gathering foot? Um, no, you do not need a gathering foot. You do not need anything um, super special. Um, so shearing is most easily accomplished with elastic thread. And, you know, it can be kind of intimidating to start with, but it's really easy. You don't need anything special, um, a special presser foot or anything. Um, just look for some elastic thread. And if it's not in the thread section, it'll probably be in the elastic section. It's just a really thin, lightweight, super stretchy thread on a spool. And you need to wind that on your bobbin um, so it comes up from the underneath of the machine. Um, and so winding it on your bobbin, for most machines, you want to wind it by hand, not too tight, but not too loose. So just applying ever so slightly stretching um, the thread as you, you're winding your bobbin. So you don't want it like too loose and kind of jumbly, but you don't want it like super tight um, for most machines. Um, so 
uh, wind that on your bobbin and, and then pop your bobbin in just like you would do normally. You can use regular all-purpose thread in your needle. Um, when shearing, you want to use a lightweight fabric. So shearing won't work on bottom weights or like corduroy, anything that's too heavy, the elastic thread won't gather it up. Um, so lightweight fabric, um, single layer, if you can, double layer will make the, the fabric heavier and it'll make it harder for the elastic to gather it up. So single layer when you can. Um, bump your stitch length up. Um, some machines you don't need to go all the way up. Um, you just need to bump it up a, a little bit. So test that out and see um, what works better, what makes the kind of gathers you want. Um, when you lengthen your stitch length more and more, it just it increases the area that um, the elastic thread can gather up. Um, so bump up your stitch length um, and start sewing your shearing lines. Um, when you sew one line, it's not going to gather up all that much, but as you sew more and more um, subsequent lines, it's going to gather up more and more. And as you're stitching more and more lines, you want to make sure the fabric is going to start to gather, but you want to make sure it's nice and flat when it's going under your needle. So kind of like flatten it out with your hands, and with your fingers as you're um, guiding it under the needle. And once you get four or five lines, you can see it's it'll start to gather up a lot more. Um, and I read that you can backstitch when you're using elastic thread in the bobbin. Um, I don't, just personal preference. I like to pull the needle thread to the wrong side and tie it off. I've read that that can um, extend the life of your elastic thread. So conflicting advice I've seen about that. Um, but I just, I don't backstitch just to be safe. Um, so you've got all of your lines of shearing. Um, and you can make it gather up even more by hitting that elastic with some steam. And it's going to just gather right up. Or you can throw it in the washer and the dryer. Um, but heat will make it really, um, really gather up. Um, so, yeah, it's really easy. Some machines, I have heard, um, they want you to wind the bobbin with the elastic thread using the machine. So it puts a lot of tension on it. Um, I've read that for brother machines or for machines where you have a drop-in bobbin instead of uh, a bobbin case, but some people have said it, it, they need to do it that way, and some people have said even with a brother, even with a drop-in case, it works just by winding it by hand. So you might have to just try it, um, consult your manual, or um, I just recommend giving it a shot, but um, the blog makeit-loveit.com has a really good shearing um, tutorial, uh, lots of good pictures. Um, I basically just covered everything the blog post covered, but um, that they have pictures there. And in the comments section um, of that blog post, a lot of people have commented on um, different ways that they do it too. And so the comment section on blogs, uh, on their blog post can be a really good place to find advice and information too. So um, you can check that out as well. But yeah, shearing is, is really easy. All you have to do is, you know, wind that, that thread on the bobbin and give it a shot, and um, you will love it. Absolutely. And just um, from experience, having a brother and having a drop-in bobbin, uh, I do personally have to wind it by hand. It just, uh, if I put too much on there, as soon as I drop it in, it just goes and it all comes out. So too much tension and it just um, comes out. So if that does happen, I usually just um, have a scrap of fabric next to where I'm starting, like two inches, because it seems like that first two inches of elastic thread is what comes untaught. Uh, so like mm -hmm. that doesn't that doesn't gather it. It takes it a couple inches. So then you just have that scrap. Get rid of it. Okay. So uh, we have time for one last question here. Uh, again, more about feet. And so uh, Leilani wants to know what is couching and can it be done with a regular presser foot? I'm glad that we got to this question. Um, hopefully I can answer it in time because I have a lot to say about couching. Um, so couching is when you, um, you're applying a braid or a cord or something on the fabric right side. Um, it can be confused a lot of times with bobbin work, which bobbin work, the, the decorative thread comes up from the bobbin. So you're sewing with the right side down and that thread comes up from, from the bobbin. But with couching, you've got the right side up and you're just applying your decorative yarn um, onto the right side, onto the face of the fabric. Um, you can use your regular presser foot if the yarn you're applying isn't super lofty. Um, 
but you know your presser foot is stitching over it so if it's got any height to it or any bulk to it and if your presser foot isn't um, in contact with the fabric it's not going to um, glide along very easily so um, you can use a open toe foot or sometimes uh, the zigzag feet for some manufacturers has a nice um, open part in the in the center for your your yarn to slide through um, but if you're using something big like a cording or a braiding they do make uh, feet that are called couching feet um, sometimes they're called braiding feet or um, cording feet but they all have a groove on the underside of the foot for the whatever you're stitching over to glide under the foot um, the couching foot, some of them look like a uh, clear plastic disc. They have a hole in the side for you to, to thread the yarn through um, so that you can control it um, easily and as you're stitching over the, the yarn. Um, some cording feet or couching feet have um, several grooves on the underside so you can apply several small um, yarns or cords or whatever. Um, at the same time in a row. So three or four grooves on the underside. Um, you want to find a foot that has the groove um, that's about this, the width of whatever you're applying to your fabric. Um, for If you're applying braiding, you'll want to use a straight stitch to go right along the center of the braid. But if you're applying anything else, um, you'll most of the time you want to use a zigzag stitch to go over um, that cord. Um, and Adjust your zigzag stitch so that it's as wide as or a little bit wider than your cord. So you're just stitching over it to attach it down. You're not stitching through it. Um, or you can use uh, another kind of decorative stitch, anything that has some width to it, to stitch over your cord. Um, beading feet also have a groove on the bottom um, for kind of tall strands of beads to go through. So there's another option uh, for a foot to use. Um, and you can use just regular thread in your needle and in your bobbin. Um, some people want to use invisible thread in the needle um, so that their embellishment really shows through. Or you can use matching thread or you can use contrasting thread. There are a lot of different combinations you can do, um, different ways to play with the combinations of, of um, fabric and cord and thread um, to do a lot of really fun things. So. Um, yeah, you can can try it out with a, an open toe foot. Otherwise, if you've got uh, your options of, of cording feet, you can look at those, and they really make it easy um, to to hold the cord in place. And it, it just is a, a good tool to use to make make it easier for you. Perfect. Well, again, thank you so much, Nikki, for answering all of these sewing questions. Uh, thank you, everyone who who tuned in and watched and participated. Uh, we definitely appreciate you guys and hope you keep tuning in every month because Nikki will be here answering your questions every month. Uh, and again, thank you so much. Thanks so so much for having me.